And so our scripture reading this morning comes from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. And it reads these words. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all of the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these? robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple, and the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of the water of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for this very instructive and strange word. All right. So, Revelation, I have entitled this sermon, The Great Multitude of Hope. The book of Revelation, it is one of the strangest books in the Bible, one that we tend to not let our eyes wander to. But the book of Revelation is part of apocalyptic literature genre, a genre that is found throughout the prophets, the book of Daniel, even in the Gospels. Apocalyptic texts like this one and the book of Revelation in general is often misunderstood by Christians and even causes us some level of panic because we don't know what to do with it. These confusing images that tend to come up of violence, of destruction, of judgment, of kingdom language and imperialism, it tends to cause us some pause and discomfort. And after all, this is understandable when you live in a world where revelation is often only preached in one context where it is preached in the context of political propaganda, sensationalized end-time predictions, and fear-mongering within the church. There are movies and book series about Revelation and what it has to predict about our future. I have good news, though. The book of Revelation is hardly a movie detailing the rapture. In fact, apocalypse in its most basic Greek definition means unveiling or revealing. The book of Revelation is said to be a series of visions that John received. Apocalyptic literature was popular in first century, especially for those Christians who were living under the Roman Empire. For people who were constantly persecuted, apocalyptic literature gave them coded language and symbols to talk about their oppression and inspire hope, gave them language and ways to talk about their oppressors without their oppressors really knowing about it. So it was the subversive genre that allowed hope to spark among marginalized people. I was thinking about 
uh, different parallels to this. I thought about how enslaved Africans use mysterious music to plan their revolts or how Afrofuturism today utilizes other worldlyism, other worldliness to communicate profound truths about the black experience today and also what a future without violence could look like. Similarly, these genres use these symbols and coded language to talk about oppression in a time where they can't talk about it outright. It's sort of like the genre of science fiction today, although not exactly, but it often uses imagination, cosmic events, other life forms, and indeed even other universes to subvert power and communicate often difficult truths about present and future hopes. One of my favorite shows is Steven Universe. It was originally advertised for children, it's a cartoon. But over the last year or so, because I'm a nerd, I've found a community of adults who love this show and com connect with it for really different reasons than children do, because we're able to see the bigger themes that are happening. And so Steven Universe is this cartoon about an, an alternative reality in which crystal gems are real characters who come to life in order to save the world from impending doom. But underneath all of that, the show unveils real power dynamics about the world today, which is why a lot of adults really like it too. The show uses coded characters and vivid imagery in this fake made up world to teach important truths about the meaning of life, the battle between good and evil, a question about whether good and evil even exist, about identity, even topics like grief and genocide. If the wrong audience is watching the show, they'd see it nothing more than just a goofy show. But for its intended audience, folks feel seen and empowered to their place in the movement. At the end of the day, this cartoon, which is often outlandish and silly, is a powerful critique on society and how we relate to the other. It's really social commentary, but put in a way that's more digestible for folks to understand. The show also seeks to spark hope in the fight against injustice, thus resonating with many viewers who live in marginalized bodies. While it's not a perfect parallel, science fiction today gives us one way of thinking about how this form of biblical literature was used when we think about Revelation. John's community would have seen Revelation not as impending doom, but about unveiling truth about society and divine promises of hope for the future. Similar to science fiction today, we do not look to this material for truth in terms of a literal timeline of events, but what it has to say about our world and even us is indeed real and true. So back to John. John is having all these visions while his community is being slaughtered both literally and figuratively. This part of Revelation occurs after plagues and cosmic battles and creepy beasts. This passage paints a picture of an alternative reality in which the oppressor is conquered and the persecuted live in freedom, comfort, and security. His vision ultimately speaks to a future reality, a heaven that is truly for all, where the marginalized are at peace and finally safe in their Savior's arms. The chapter speaks as motivation for the community to keep fighting in the present, to keep worshiping, to keep praying, because we know how the story will end. And it is also their responsibility then to fight for that reality in the here and now. As people of faith, we know that this too is our ultimate hope, a promised existence where justice is fully realized and experienced. And John has the opportunity to see that world clearly in his vision. 
ultimately this passage is about subversion and subverting our understanding of power. It illustrates a world where the battles of this life have been fought and won. He sees a reality in which the empire is brought low and the persecuted ones are now exalted. And yet this world is not one in which violence simply stops. It's more than that. As my friend Alex said this week, it ruptures in a way that also heals completely. As John's community moves through a world where the Roman Empire rules and persecutes, in his vision, he envisions a world where God is the one who is worshipped rather than the emperor. And this God does not rule with, pre with prejudice or weapons or brutality, but with equity, with love, with healing and the wholeness of all things. In Revelation 7, we see a great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language gathered together before the throne of God. This is the saints, a multicultural, multi-faith, multi-generational gathering from all the ends of the earth, representing all humanity, worshiping God and not Rome. It would have been revolutionary at the time. These are the visions of the saints. During the last few months, we've embarked on a journey to uncover and celebrate unsung women heroes of the Bible. These women, known and unknown, have shown us wisdom, resilience, and strength that lie within the pages of scripture. From the midwives, Miriam and Jochebed, who paved the way for Moses to be born. From the daughters of Zelophehad, who demanded their inheritance. To Esther and Vashti's resistance to patriarchy. We've explored Rahab and her inclusion in the lineage of Jesus. The unconventional love between Ruth and Naomi. We've explored Hannah's grief and prayer that opened up new worlds. Hagar, the slave woman who was the first to name God, and Huldah, a prophet who led the people of God. Each of these women has played a unique role in shaping our faith and our story together, showing us how to struggle in our world with grace and fortitude. And if I can say this, John in his vision offers us a glimpse of a world where these women are not forgotten. They are named and they are also there rejoicing and they too are exalted, whole and free. In John's vision, he sees an endless multitude of people from every end of the earth, of every shade, of every gender, of every embodiment, clothed in white robes and holding palm branches together. It includes women and other marginalized gender expressions, magnifying their role and acknowledging their contributions to history as well as our faith stories together. John's dream would recognize their acts of courage, their resistance to oppression, their unwavering faith, their acts of compassion. Apocalyptic literature, though it's cryptic, carries a message of liberation for the forgotten, for all of those women that I lifted up today, the women that we will continue to explore, and the women who died without anyone knowing their names. In his dream space, John sees a world where the persecuted community is not always hopeless and not always downtrodden. In that heavenly place, the battle has been won against white supremacy and patriarchy and queer phobia. It's a place where people lay down their swords, where wounds are nursed. It's a place where people finally come and receive their crowns and their true rest. It's a place where there are no more tears, where there is no more pain. There are no more microaggressions or bombs or 
contaminated water, or harmful bathroom bills, or hate crimes, where people do not fear their safety. It is a place where there is only healing, only peace, only safety, only love, only creativity, only resurrection. Where there is only God and those who have fought the good faith in life, whether it's been for a hundred years or whether it's been for only a few days. It's a place for those who have lived and lived completely with battle scars that do not hurt them anymore, a place where justice prevails. On All Saints Sunday, we cannot help but also picture this world. The first week of November is a time where we pause to remember and imagine. We are invited to remember that as we live our life of faith, we do not do it alone. The Bible says we are surrounded always, but especially now, by a great cloud of witnesses. Do you feel them? Our spiritual ancestors, those trailblazers who have gone before us and laid a foundation for us to build upon. They are those ordinary women, children, elders inside and outside of the church who were imperfect and yet a part of our story together. During the season, we remember that close connection between this world and the next. We might light candles or display photos or say special prayers this week. We might visit graveyards or share memories. We remember our loved ones who we have lost in the last year or any other time. We remember now and honor all those who have inspired our paths and set examples for us to follow, even those people we've never met. We remember our spiritual heroes and biblical giants, those with names and those names we do not know. We remember all those who made it possible for us to be here today. We remember those for whom the Bible says they have faced the great ordeal. And we also imagine, we imagine that those we love are held by God right now, that those who have suffered greatly on this earth are now safe, and that those who have died continue on through us again and again. We imagine ourselves surrounded by that great multitude of saints who cheer us on from their places of victory. And finally, we imagine a promised world where the things that the saints fought for on earth are finally fully realized. John's vision is about that future, but it's also about the now. And so until that final day comes, we work now to bring heaven's world to earth. We protest, we march, we sign petitions, we pray, we perform acts of service, we break bread, every week. We donate our resources, we attend conferences, we care for the poor and the grieving. We must tempt and accelerate the coming of that world. We must make it impossible for that world to escape. This is our hope. Amen. And so now is your opportunity to share your reflections and how this message might be moving in you. Thank you very much, Brooke, for a very insightful and thorough analysis of revelations, I think. <coughs> Um, I was thinking as you were talking that in the midst of oppression, um, those who are oppressed, they can do one of sort of three things. They can accommodate themselves to oppression, and large numbers of people who are oppressed do that. Mm. Um, or they can um, engage in various types of terrorists activities, 
uh, poison the master. Um, some of the slaves did that. Um, or um, terrorism and other horrible ways that we're experiencing today in the Middle East and we experience here in 9-11 as well. That's a, w a way of responding. Or another way is to, to silently um, and creatively mm -hmm. resist. Mm. And the creative part mm -hmm. <coughs> is the key for that type of resistance, mm -hmm. which I think we see in the civil rights movement, in large parts of the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King Jr., we see in the feminist movement, the womanist movement, and, and so forth. Uh, it's a quiet, uh, creative um, resistance. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is what is present uh, in a pervasive way in revelations, mm -hmm. uh, using symbols and metaphors and, uh, and, and language. Yeah. Um, it is a strong message of quiet, creative resistance. Yeah. And mm. I, I think you've exemplified that very well mm. in, your, um, in your presentation today. So thank you for that. Mm. Thank you, Peter. That was a beautiful reflection. And yeah, that was something that uh, was really, really inspiring me this week to think about um, this book as an act of resistance um, in, a, in a subtle way, but one that is still teaching us today and obviously has been misused, um, but returning it to its purpose. Yeah, Judy. Uh, I, I was thinking about um, the thoughts of anger, when we react out of anger or we react out of love. I was reading Oswald Chambers this morning and that there was a passage in there that really hit me because I think about how angry I am about what's happening here, what's happening in the war, what's happening uh, in in uh, our country today politically uh, and I and I react to that in anger and I gossip about it and I, I realized when I was reading this book today that that was um, the wrong way we can't approach anything in anger mm -hmm. that the results of what we do out of anger is never good uh, so it made me think about I have to really start praying and asking for forgiveness and trying to figure out a way that out of love I can resist mm. and not out of anger. Mm. Well, and I have to believe that the anger can also be a teacher, right? Like that there are good things we can do with our anger as well. Um, so it's about how we use that anger, not necessarily try to get rid of it. But yeah, but being creative, yeah, I think it's a great um, way to honor those who came before us. I yeah. wanted to bounce off of that and say that one thing that I have heard and been told that I think is kind of beautiful in a way is that anger and love are not necessarily opposites. It's um, anger can be a form of love. If someone you love has been hurt, sometimes you might be angry on their behalf and that can inspire you to take care of that person to make sure that they are okay. When I had my first allergic react, like really like anaphylactic level um, allergic reaction, uh, to be blunt, someone purposely caused it. It was not a great time, and mm. um, my friend who saved my life was quite angry, and mm. but funneled that into making sure I was okay. Used that adrenaline to make sure like I was safe and to focus on how to prevent it from happening again. And I really think that at the end of the day with anger, it comes down to how you harness it because it's a reaction to injustice. It's a reaction to, um, it, it is an extension of love depending on how you use it, not necessarily the opposite of it. I don't know, that's my personal belief on it though. Yeah, thank you, Judy and Theo. Great reflections. 
Yeah, Jaden. I'm gonna sound like a total nerd, but uh, <laughs> 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 a great way to start off. <laughs> but uh, when you were talking about the uh, show Steven Universe, <laughs> personally, it's not my uh, cup of tea. But you know, <laughs> looking, we'll looking, talk after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but looking back on it, it did show a lot of representation, but, like, not um, sometimes physically with, you know, LGBT, but, you know, sometimes it showed, like, a lot of, like, um, represent representation of trauma, grief, yeah. depression, like, anger, and, like, love in several ways, and even though it can be very uh, corny at times... <laughs> <laughs> with, with it is, but um, it d it really does show a lot of uh, revelation with how uh, the main character tries to fight back for what is right, for his um, for his earth that they constantly try to destroy and with these unfair acts mm -hmm. and stuff. So it's a very great representation of it, even though it's I personally may not. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. all right. <laughs> yeah, but no, I'm it, 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 it's very. <laughs> It's very good representing. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jaden, for... <laughs> Thank you, Jaden, for some of that. <laughs> um, it's a great show. <laughs> no, no, but um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're right. Um, it, it is one of those things that is really trying to get at some really big issues in a way that even children can understand, even adults can grasp. And sometimes we struggle with just being lectured. You know, we need a story. We need another world to really wrap our arms around um, real issues. So I think that that's exactly what is happening in, in this book. Um, so yeah, even if you don't watch Steven Universe, but there are other examples of that um, because these are the creative ways that we, we speak out about what people are experiencing, yeah. Any other reflections? I was thinking of dealing with the violence that takes place in Revelations. Yes, um, right before this <laughs> <laughs> chapter. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that's something that needs to be dealt with too. And the way I deal with it is to say that uh, evil um, will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, our faith in God is one that says God is opposed, not only opposed to evil, but that God will eventually destroy it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it will wipe it off the face of the earth. <laughs> right. and, uh, and, but, but in God's way and in God's time, <laughs> sure. uh, that will happen. But that can be difficult to um, to deal with, yeah. <laughs> particularly if you are a victim of the evil. Yeah. Uh, you want to sometimes get ahead of God <laughs> by destroying it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the only way we can do that is by, is by using love. But using love in the presence of evil can come very close to accommodating yeah. yourself to the evil. So there's a dilemma here <laughs> between evil and resistance, mm -hmm. and what the end of the resistance and the means of the resistance mm -hmm. is. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you, Peter. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, if we had read the chapters leading up to this one, there would have been a lot of conversation about about violence and I think there's a lot to unpack there but at least part of it is being able to understand that it's people who are hurting trying to figure out what their desired end would look like and sometimes that's not always the way that God <laughs> would want it to happen um, but it's certainly understandable that uh, when they imagine being free it would include the oppressor being destroyed, right, in some sense. And so we can empathize with it and also want to push it further. Like, are there other creative ways uh, that peace can be achieved? Um, and so we, we can empathize as well as uh, find our own ways of entering into the, into the conversation. But that's a, that's a really good point. And we see that all throughout the Bible. Uh, imperfect people 
struggling for solutions, uh, sometimes ones that we want to replicate and sometimes ones we don't. Yeah, Heather. I just think the thing that keeps coming back to my mind was the point at the very beginning of that passage of all the people from all the tribes. Yeah. Right? Because people like to glaze over that. Mm -hmm. Those white supremacists, those, you know, the, the differences in tribes and cultures don't want to remember or accept mm -hmm. everybody. You know, and yeah. so that's, and even when, you know, people are giving sermons on this, they're not going to bring that unification together mm. if it doesn't fit their, their story. But it's a, it's a pretty big part of it. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, I agree. And, um, you know, that, that's part of the people dreaming of what their world might look like is just everybody being able to be at the throne together. Um, countless amount of people from every nation, tribe, language, color, shade, you know, we can add in all of the variations of the human experience that maybe they didn't have language for at the time, but certainly we would include gender, certainly we would include, you know, sexual orientation in that um, unification before God. Um, and, and we need to, and we need to figure out how do we get our world to look more like that. Yeah. Any other reflections? All right. Well, thank you all so much for your conversation and reflection. We will have opportunities uh, in the service to name our own uh, loved ones and saints that we would like to honor and lift up. So thank you for that.